YouTube, Electric Adventures here. A long time between drinks again, and this is the next episode in Let's Make a Retro Game. Um, this is a series where we're going through the various steps required to make a game for various old systems. Um, and I must understand these episodes actually take quite a long time to produce. I do thoroughly enjoy working on them. Um, I have been stuck on some technicalities for a little while because um, I am very pedantic at getting things right. There's no point doing a tutorial series if the information being presented isn't isn't correct. Um, now this, these episodes come with um, the written guide which you can see up on the screen at the moment. We're going to work through a little bit of that. Um, there is a set of downloadable source code. At the moment we're covering three systems with the source code which is Coleco, MSX and Spectre Video. Now the Spectre Video is the point that's been holding me up. Um, the Spectre Video, even though it was the machine um, that came out um, before the MSX and the Coleco um, and there are a lot of design tracks and the you know the MSX was based off the Spectre Video format, they did actually make a number of changes when um, the MSX standard got put in place. Um, so my original template uh, that I gave you guys back in the day was okay for the code that we had um, but there were some issues uh, basically um, how the screen mode was being selected and I couldn't work it out for such a long time it also does interrupts a little bit different from the others as well but I have sorted those out and as a bonus to this episode for those <coughs> who want to go back to episode 13 I have re-released the templates for the Spectre video for that episode with the start and end files. Um, so we're now we are all completely up to date on all three systems. Now I will over time go back and update the files for the episodes 1 through 12 for the Spectre video as well. But I will let you know on my website when I get around to that. So this particular episode we're not actually going to make any progress in our game. Because um, I realised by some of the questions that were being asked by people that um, <clears throat> I need to cover the actual um, uh, the graphics capabilities of the system so people can understand um, what we're doing in the future a little better. So this episode is specifically on the uh, graphics chip used by the Coleco, the MSX, the Spectre Video, the um, Sega SG1000, SC3000, just noticed a type mistake in my text there. It's also used by the TI-994 and 4A, the Memotech MTX, the Creative Vision, also known as the Dick Smith Wizard, and also the Einstein. Um, and I've missed another one up there. There's a Sword M5, also uses this graphics chip. So it's in a lot of computers. Now, the majority of the systems I just listed all uses Z80 as their main processor, um, although the one, Creative Vision Dick Smith Wizard, actually uses a 6502, just to keep things interesting. So this is very similar to the arcade games uh, released around the same period where you'd have a main processor for doing uh, the general thinking and then you'd have another processor uh, that would handle the sound and another processor that would handle the graphics. Um, so they designed some of the early computers to use similar technology. And a wildly, um, and Texas Instruments uh, back in the day made lots of chips. And one of their chips that they made and obviously sold to a lot of companies was the TMS9918 graphics processor, which is the one specific one used in the TI-994, um, and then they brought out a revision of it called the TI-9918A and two variants, the 9928A and 29A. Um, they are basically um, ones for uh, specifically for NTC region, and another one is for the CCAM region. Um, there is a really good guidebook, so. I have some information in this article which you'll find but it's not going to have everything in it because I'm not going to reproduce everything that you can go and find in a book. So here is the book. This is the book that you want. So from Texas Instruments, it does have a little bit of code in there for the 9900 processor which is not a Z80 um, that the tech TI used but it does cover the actual graphics chip and its capabilities quite well. Um, it has diagrams and things like that but it is very technical. So the idea of this particular episode was we're going to peel that back a little bit and um, take it from a slightly higher level. So, um, <clears throat> and the article you're seeing here is sort of reiterating what I'm talking about. Now, one of the key concepts here is you have your 
I'm just going to say Z80 because most of them do. The Z80 processor, and it has its own RAM. Uh, the Coleco only has 1K of RAM, the uh, SG1000 has 2K, uh, most of the computers have at least 32K or more. Z80 can actually address quite a bit of RAM um, with RAM switching and things like that. But anyway, it's got its own RAM and the CPU can talk directly to that RAM quite fast. Um, but the TMS processor, we'll just refer to it as the TMS processor, is a graphics processor. It's an actual CPU in its own right and it has its own RAM. Um, and unlike, say, a system like the Spectrum, um, where its Z80 writes to the RAM and its graphics are drawn directly from that same RAM. Now, one of the problems that has is that both of those, um, and they use a custom ULA chip to actually draw to the screen. Um, what, when that is happening, um, you have reduced... So two things can't read and write to the same location at once. They need to share. And this can reduce, uh, lead to um, you know clashes and 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 things like that. The Spectrum handles it very well. It's probably not the best example, but other systems um, have these issues. So by separating the logic, the um, the graphics chip and the main chip with their own set of memories, they can just get on with their job and do what they want to do and not be interrupted. It does have a little bit of a disadvantage. Um, so oh, here we go. We'll put up a little diagram here. There you go. Everybody loves diagrams. And actually, my my face is going to be away of a bit of it anyway. So how uh, this is the RAM of the Z80, and this is the RAM of the Texas Instruments chip. All right? The Z80 can't talk to this RAM, and the Texas Instruments chip can't talk to this RAM. They're not connected whatsoever to the to the RAM they have. So. To draw something on the screen, this chip uses whatever is in it RAM to determine what goes on the screen. And whatever code is running is in the RAM here in your Z80 chip. <clears throat> but what it has is a number of ports, and think of them like serving windows. So you go up to the window and you ask, uh, you give it a particular command, and then you say, here's the information to go with that command. So the commands go across what's called the control port. So it's sort of like you're, you're making a selection from a list off the board. And the data port is the information you ever give the TMS thing, or the TMS gives back, because you can write and you can read. So you have this little window that you need to get things through. <coughs> now, luckily, the Z80 is pretty fast um, and is very good at doing ports. So it can actually get a fair bit of data through here in a short period of time. But it does come to some restrictions, which is why um, at as I'll explain a little later, why the TMS chip is not so good for games where you want to um, have scrolling screens and things. But it does have a lot of features, which is what makes it so good for making uh, ports of early arcade games. Right, let's go down to our next section here. So, this way of doing things may seem strange to um, people with other machines, say like a Commodore 64, an Amstrad or a Spectrum. But the main advantages are, the main process is that it does not have to do anything to draw the screen. It has nothing to do with drawing the screen. So you get every single cycle of the Z80 for doing whatever you want. And you can do stuff on the Z80 at exactly the same time the screen's been drawn too. It's another very big point. The main process doesn't have to share its RAM, so there's no delay accessing the RAM. So once again, I'm hard before, only one thing can read and write to RAM at a time, usually. And the video RAM, likewise is completely dedicated to the TMS processor and 16k is a lot of RAM so back in the day as, as, as we said you know Clico only came with 1k of work RAM because RAM was expensive so the actual RAM that the video chip has is quite a lot and some of other computers so like your original 16k spectrum after you took away the RAM that you were using to display what was on screen you didn't have a lot of room left for your code and the same was true for the, even the Commodore 64. It lost a large chunk of RAM, depending on which mode you're in. Now, the other uh, thing that the um, TMS chip gives you are hardware sprites. Now, sprites are another layer that goes over the top of the background graphics. So you've got a bit of background graphics, and it draws those, and you have color limitations and things you can do with that. But sprites actually sit on top of that. And there are 32 of them, so you're going to display 32 sprites. It does have some other limitations. The chip only has so much processing power, so it can only display... Uh, four sprites in any one particular line on the screen. But you can use tricks to get around that. And all the sprite layers are only one colour each, but they can all be a different colour. 
All right, now the disadvantage are there are limits to how fast information can be sent up and down those ports we're talking about. So you can't change large amounts of video for RAM in each frame. And that's why scrolling can be difficult. Okay, um, now you have actually different modes. It's not just the one mode. So there are two graphics modes, one and two. These modes have a screen resolution of 256 pixels by 192 pixels, but those pixels are made up of, hopefully you can, this is coming out okay in the video, of 32, so 32 across, by, I can't quite fit that all on there, 24 tiles high. Um, and you define them with patterns. Now that's 768 tiles. And unlike us other systems, I'm talking about you, the NES, you actually have enough tiles to fill this whole screen. So you truly can put whatever graphics you want in whatever spot. Um, the spectrum is the same. It has enough uh, pattern memory to do the whole thing. It just has restrictions on color. Now you have two sets of memory. One that defines the shape that appears for each tile and another bit of memory that defines the color. Um, once again, they, they, they use um, pretty much 4K of RAM for the patterns and 4K of video RAM for the color. And that allows each line, so each one by eight pixels of each tile to have a different foreground and background color. So you've got the pattern defined by the sprite, oh, and I do have some things here. So here's, here's the information that shows the pattern of a sprite. So this is like making a little um, ball or space invader. It's actually a space invader if you look carefully. Probably should have had the graphics here as well. So and it all is is ones and zeros. So one means a pixel's on and zero means a pixel is off. Um, now the two graphics mode. Graphics mode one does have some restrictions because it was designed uh, for versions of the video chip that only came with 4K of RAM. So there's only 256 tiles to use for the whole screen and mode 2 has the full range of patterns and mode 2 is usually the mode that is used in most titles. To explain mode 1 a little better how the colour goes, for each set of 8 um, tiles you can have a single foreground and background colour for the whole tile, so not each line, whereas mode 2 has another 8 bytes for every single tile pattern that describes the foreground and background colour of each row. I probably should have demonstrated the color, but I think our code is going to demonstrate that a little better. Two modes are very similar, but obviously the amount of RAM they use. So 12K just for the patterns and color information, and then on top of that you have the sprite patterns and sprite information. There is a text mode, um, probably the best way to describe it if you've ever used a Coleco and you have your game start screen, that's the usual text mode that you can see. So it's 40 columns by 24 and the patterns are slightly skinnier, they're only, <coughs> um, it, you can see it doesn't use two of the bits, so you've only got six pixels across for each of the characters, but that's enough for quite decent text. Alright, I'm screwing through this, once again this document is available. There is another mode called multicolored mode that pretty much hardly anybody uses, you can still use sprites, so it's only 64 by 48 pixels, but you can have any color you want for each one of those pixels and sprites on top of it. So you can do some funky stuff with that. And a really quick thing on the sprites. So the sprites can either be eight by eight pixels or 16 by 16 pixels. And there are 32 of them, regardless of whichever size you choose. Plus you can also magnify them so they can be doubled. The pixels can be doubled in size. Each sprite can only be one of the 16 colors available, one of which is transparent, so really there are 15 colors available. <coughs> you can create multicolored sprites by stacking sprites on top of each other, but you've just got to be careful that you can only get four sprites in a particular row on a screen. Um, although with some tricks that I've, are already in the library of um, code that you get with these episodes, eight in a row can easily be uh, obtained by drawing different sprites for each. Uh, instead of every 60 frames a second, you get into 30 frames a second human eye can't see it, and you get eight solid sprites, which is great. And, it, and the sprites, along with the colourful tiles and the colours range, are what allow Coleco MSX and Spectre Video to, you know, do those early 80 arcade games so well. Alright, so let's go into our example code. So just a second, I'll arrange my screen a little bit.
Okay, so for this particular episode, we have a brand new starting bit of code. So this is, um, you might as well say, um, <coughs> just a straight, very simple application. So um, we set our screen phone mode, we initialize our RAM, we set up timers and interrupts. This is code has been covered in previous episodes. We have a little block here that um, we label title screen. We clear our pattern table, which basically clears our screen. We clear our sprites. We write that all. So as far as we're concerned, everything is turned off. We load our character set. I'll go through that in a bit more detail in a minute. And then we plop some text on the screen. So it's at um, so 32 across by 12. So 12 down, 10 across. And we set our writing position, and that's where our title text it'll be down in the code a little bit. And then we have a function called Apple Text, we'll go through that in a second. We set our interrupt up, and then we just basically go around on a loop. So, very, very simple. Uh, this is just a demo, demo in graphics capabilities. Our load character set loads uh, our character set. Now, this character set isn't compressed just to make it easier for you guys to see. The patterns, um, and what we what I do to make it simpler is you've got three um, sets of 256 characters. I just make all each of the three sets exactly the same. So when we're referring to a particular number, that's what that's doing. Ooh, and there's a little uh, <coughs> extra return there. Doesn't matter. And initialize RAM's got nothing in at the moment, and our interrupt routines have got nothing in at the moment. Here's our little output text function. So it, all it does is gets the value out of whatever is pointed to by HL. If it equals 255, otherwise it sends it out our data port. Remember our control and data port? So data port, which is sending our data, sends it out, increments our pointer, and it jumps around and it does it again. And what data are we going to send? We're going to send 30, 23, 29, nothing, 14, 41, 49, 51, 63, and then there's our 255 for the end. And that truly is the end of our program. So it's very, very simple. Um, and what does it do at the moment? So let's compile that. So build. Bring up our emulator. Just make, just make sure. Oops. We'll do our MSX version. <coughs> so that's the directory I'm in. Okay, so fires up. Now, if we go through our MSX boot logo, we get the words TMS demo exclamation mark on the screen in a nice funky font. That's it. So let's stop that. And now there are some other files in here. There is our patterns. All right, and a blank sprite button. This is this is this file is actually output from my sprite and tile editing tool, which I'm about to run. It has the pattern, so these that's the shape data. And you scroll down and you can see here's the colour data. And they're not very fancy at the moment, but it's it's they're just numbers at the moment, very hard to understand what in the world's in them. So let's run my sprite and dial editor. Um, by the way, which <coughs> has in, been enhanced greatly since we first started the series. So let's load. There we go, we're actually in the right place. So this sprite file is included, so if you um, download my tile editor, you'll be able to have a look as well. So there, as you can see, there are no sprite patterns. Let's go and have a look at our character sets, though. We have a character set here. It's actually, funnily uh, enough, the character set I'm using to write uh, my conversion of Berserk. It's a, quite a nice uh, font. It also demonstrates, you can see how the, the, these letters are green and the text is grey. Let's go down a little bit because I've made a couple of patterns here, <coughs> which sort of demonstrate uh, the graphics capabilities a little better. So all you do is you click on the patterns you want to use at the moment. That puts the numbers here. We get them from the table, and then they're in the editor. So this particular one has um, different foreground and background colors, and different pixel rating. So that gives you. It, 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 allows a little bit of shade. So you've got lighter green here and darker green here. 
and then we have this one it's basically all these pixels are on so they're not setting the background colors and we're using three different reds which gives us a bit of a stripy pattern and then over here we're setting the foreground and background and we have vertical stripes and this one same thing and horizontal stripes so very very simple patterns and as we'll talk about later you can you could have more complicated patterns and achieve um, more special effects as well so this <coughs> but hopefully we, this tool illustrates how you can have different color so you can actually have a different foreground and background color for every line of a pattern and it allows quite colorful and creative graphics if you um, if you get right into it this really shows the, the color quite well but I could have had another pattern in here and had uh, different background colors mixed in that could have been not even red or something like that so that's our pattern and all I've done from here is I've gone file save as and I've saved it as an assembler file and selected our patterns file and press save and that actually wrote this whole file now in the options you can change the format that it outputs it um, so at the moment I'm just using decimal because it's easier to read for this particular example you can say what appears here you can also turn compression on as well at the moment it selects a compression called pletter and in my library there are routines for displaying this fine one uh, through all those it's right down end here <coughs> so timer functions maybe not not in this particular example anyway um, in the code that's in the main part of our branch you will have um, uh, uh, the ability to display a pletter image on screen not just um, so I know it's a compressed bit of data not that we're running out of room in our in any sort of ROM at the moment for our particular demonstration so anyway we've loaded those particular characters on the screen we're only using the letters TMS demo exclamation mark at the moment so let's uh, put some other code in here and um, add to this and turn it into a bit of a demo. So, all right. So let's <clears throat> put some tiles, some more tiles on the screen. So let's go back to here. So there's our initial text here. Let's go and grab a little bit more code. So the top one third of the screen. So uh, destination. So H RAM name is that is our tile table in our video RAM. We're going to have 256 bytes. So we're going to fill the whole thing with one character. It's character 69. Now what was 69? It should be this one here. 69. And call fill RAM. So that just starting it there for 256 bytes. It's going to fill it with this one character. So let's save that build that and now let's go back and run that and now as you can see our little pattern is repeated in the top part of our screen here that looks pretty cool alright now it's just patterns on the screen so we've just put individual tiles on the screen now let's make it do something interesting um, now see here how we've set up this hook this is our time um, our code that runs every time we get a, a vertical uh, a vertical blank so when you redraw the screen the processor starts up the top of the screen draws the screen draw 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 gets down the bottom and when it reaches the bottom it's got to move all the way up to the top of the screen and a bit of time passes and that's the time to write to the screen when nothing's happening because if you write to the screen when it's drawing to the screen um, you could uh, or for a start it's a lot slower and you could also unfortunately affect what comes in the screen that's how you can get garbage characters coming out on the screen so in that vertical blank time that's the perfect time to push stuff through to the screen as quickly as possible there's no delay because the video chip isn't doing anything other than moving the cursor back up to the top um, and we're not going to corrupt anything on the screen so that's what our hooks all about so this bit of code output VDP site was called every time there's a vertical language so 50 times a second or 60 times a second depending 
on the um, system. So here it is here. So let's chuck in a bit of code. Okay, now let's go through this bit of code first. We've just got a little bit of a wait thing here because we don't actually want to do this 50 or 60 times a second. That's way too fast. You probably wouldn't actually see much on the screen. It would just really, really flicker. So I have a bit of RAM called wait. I load the value in there. I compare it to zero. Um, if it is zero, I'm going to jump down here. Otherwise, I decrease the value of A and store it back in wait and then return and just jump out so say it was one the first time it came in here load it in it's not zero we decrease it it isn't and store that and that would now be zero store it back in wait return and then next interrupt we come back we load it into the wait it would be zero and we continue on with a bit of code here um i think we've made it even slower than that even 30 you know twice a um uh you know, even even two frames is far too quick for the for the aisle off of the time. Okay, next bit of code, <clears throat> and yeah, it's eight. Eight every eight frames, we're actually going to do these changes. Um, we might play about with that and show you the difference as well. So if we reach zero and we're going to draw, then we need to set weight up for the next time. So we load eight into A and store it into weight. So it's going to wait another eight frames before it comes back in here. And at first, what, what would we want to do? Animate the pattern in in tile 69, right? So um, our patterns are stored at <coughs> position 0 in the video RAM. So we want pattern 69 is 69 times 8 uh, bytes through the thing. So that's our starting thing. We call that to, to um, set right, so that we're going to write that thing. We're going to write uh, four times and uh, you'll, you'll see what's going on here so this particular thing is only a pattern and then another pattern it's only it's only the bytes are only flipping back and forth and it's t and they're two lines um, so two pixels high so we get our last pattern the pattern we wrote last as so we'll set these um, these bits of memory up later, put it into A, and then we output that twice. So that's going to make the first two rows the same pattern. And then we use XOR <coughs> to flip the bits. So in this particular one, it's 11001100. If we XOR that, um, with um, a byte with all of the bits turned on, it's going to invert what is there so it'll turn it into this pattern so it's a really quick simple way of, of um, changing the pattern and then we're going to so we invert the bit and then we go around and write that out twice we invert it again so we're back to our original pattern and um, we go through this four times so that'll get if we're writing two bytes a time that'll do all eight lines of our pattern then we next order it one more time, so that'll make it the pattern different from last time when we stored it in last pattern. So every time we come into this, this last pattern is going to be the the pattern of the what we're going to write in the first row of the next one. I hope we're not um, making that too confusing. And then we return there. That return doesn't really need to be there. There we go. So that's pretty simple so far. But We've, got, we've used some memory locations things here that we haven't set up yet, so we need to go and do that before we forget. So let's go down and add a couple of spots to store some things. So down the bottom, org RAM starts, this is where RAM is. We've got our weight, and we DS, so that allows space, so one byte space and one byte space, so weight and last pattern one. Now. Yes, we've got RAM now. There's one more important thing that you need to do. They need these patterns need to be at a known state. You can't just assume they're going to be zero. They could have random garbage in them. So let's here we go. Here's our init RAM function. Let's go and put some values in there. If I can click in the right spot. <coughs> so our last pattern. We're going to put 204 on that, and our weight, 
we're going to put the initial eight that we're talking about in there. Okay, so let's save that. Build it. Go back to our emulator and run it. So this time every eight frames we're going to go in there and change the pattern for that one tile character. And there you go, we have a whole section of the screen that is animating with us just changing eight bytes of it, which obviously doesn't take very much time at all. So you could do a lot of this every frame if you wanted to. So it's I hope it's starting to open people's eye, you know eyes of what you can do in by changing very little memory. So that's just changing the actual patterns for that one tile and that one tile being used in lots of different places. <clears throat> and the pattern I've used is a very simple pattern. You could do more complicated patterns. You could also use more tiles. Think of um, uh, you had four tiles um, with a couple of different uh, versions of it pre-scrolled. You could actually get some quite interesting um, patterns that looked like it was scrolling. And this is supposed to look like um, you know grass blowing in the wind or if it was made up of blues it might look like water that's moving. Alright <clears throat> well, let's add some more to our demo. So that was animating the pattern tables, the actual bit patterns. Let's animate um, the, uh, the, the actual colour table instead. So let's go back up and we'll put a bit more on the screen. So that's the top one third of the screen. Sorry, my stomach's a little easy at the moment. Must be getting hungry. So in the middle one third of the screen, so starting at position 256 for 256 bytes, we're going to put pattern 70. So that should be this uh, three grades of red here. And just to de quickly demonstrate that. And our text is written after that, so it goes over and you can still see it. So there we go, we've got some nice stripes on the screen. And that looks pretty nice by itself. And I was also demonstrating the colours a little bit. Now, <clears throat> I'm just going to add a little bit more code here, because uh, I thought it added a more strike. Now, this is a very uh, brute force way of getting drawing a box around our text that's on the screen. There are probably heaps of better ways of doing this. So there's a whole heap of code here and it outputs um, pattern 72 which is this one here which is our horizontal blue, two blue striped patterns um, and uh, pretty much draws a line across, down, left and right which and draws a box around our text. So let's have a look at that. Just trying to demonstrate how the individual tiles are controlling both the pattern and the colour that's being displayed, and uh, you know how from something that was fairly boring and plain, we've now got something that is actually quite colourful. All right, now let's make it do something exciting. Let's go back to our interrupt routine down here. <coughs> so we've got our same weight. Uh, animate the pattern in tile, we'll leave that there. Uh, but now we'll add a little bit of code to animate the um, colored tile. So we'll add this at, after this one. Just add a blank line there so we can see it. Let's go back up and have a look what it does. Oops. So animate the palette entries in, on the second zone. So it's our VRAM colour table um, plus this value because it's actually the colour table for the middle part of the screen we're talking about here. And 70 is our character number times 8 pixels because once again the colour patterns take up 8 bytes each. We set that as our right position in video RAM. Now we're using another variable here, last pattern 2. We go and get what's in there and increment its value if it's equal to 3 
we set it back to zero, otherwise we skip pass. So what's that? The pattern is going to go zero, one, two, and then go back to zero. So it's got three different patterns it's going to go through. And then wherever we've got our last pattern, we save it back in there. Now we have a color table, which we'll put in in a minute. <coughs> and um, now we're setting BC, which is our counter, to the pattern in A. Then we clear out A and we add this BC value to HL. So the start of the color table plus our pattern number is where our HL is going to be pointing to. And then we're going to get that out of our pattern table and we're going to output that three times, increment the address we were looking at in HL, get the value, output that three times, increment the address again, grab the value and output it two times. And if you look at that, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I've written all eight values. Uh, we do need our color table though. <clears throat> We'll just pop that straight down here. Let's have a look at our color table. So these are, and let's go and have a look at our character here. So <coughs> actually, it might even be easier if we have a look. So that's that's number seventy. So let's go into our pattern table and go all the way down here into our color table, and then look at number seventy. So it's going to it's going 96, 96, 96, 1 to 8, 1 to 8, 1 to 8, 1, 4, 4, 1, 4, 4. So there are basically our three red colours. So we're doing 96, 128, 144. That's how it's set up originally. And then we want to rotate around. So 96 comes after that and 128 comes apart. And if we're pointing at the start here, we'll go 1, 2, 3. Next time when we come in, we increment our pattern. We'll start here, go one, two, three. And then the third time around, one, two, three. Next time around, our um, thing will increase to three and it will reset back to the start of the table. So all we're doing is we're setting the our colors to this one, this one, this one, or this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and then we start again. That's what this section of code is doing. Right, now we've used this new variable, so we need to go and add that to our RAM table. down the bottom here, like so, exactly the same as the other one, one byte reserved, and then <coughs> find our init RAM, and we just want to put a zero in this one, because that's basically, it is our, um, how far through our color table we want to go. So XORing A just clears it and make it zero, and we store that in last pattern two. So that's all ready to go again. Build. And let's go and have a look. So this should make our color cycle. So first time round it should be this red, this red, this red. Next time round this red will be here, this red will be here, and this one will be here. And what does that look like? <clears throat> so depending on how your eyes see this, you'll either see the red area going up or going down. And notice how it's not affecting our blue area around our text or our text. And it's also not affecting our other animation going up in the top section either. So already we've got a couple of really cool looking effects going. Alright, let's do one more. And this is one that starts to give you a bit of a hint of what you can do um, to simulate scrolling. <clears throat> now I'm only going to do a really simple example here, um, but I'm sure uh, you guys out there could figure out some more complicated ones once you've got started. So let's, very simple, we want to add in, so the last third of our screen, so our name table plus 512 for 256 bytes, and it's pattern 71. What's 71? 
it's this vertically striped um, two blue one so let's save that build so that now our whole screen should be filled full of tiles so I've got our green up top our red in the middle and our vertical blue stripes down the bottom currently not doing anything so let's go <coughs> and add a bit more code okay back down to our interrupt routine so one two right animate the palette entries in the third zone so we're using a variable here last pattern three <clears throat> now what we're going to do is um, swap the upper and lower number by rotating four times so rotating rather than shifting actually takes so you rotate once and it takes all the bytes moves them to the left and then the byte that falls out this side rotate round and comes back in on the other side so you do that four times you've moved the lower four bytes to the top four bytes sorry bits the lower four bits to the top four bits and the top four bits are now in the bottom four bits you've switched those two nibbles as as they're called <clears throat> so that's whatever pattern we end up with we store it back in this so that we know what we're starting from that pattern next time now we go to our color table um, uh, plus <coughs> and this put, puts it the, the, um, the third part of our color table and it's character 71 times 8 gives us our pattern number we want to write the same value um, 8 times so we put our counter at 8 and we call our fill round function now <coughs> we have um, added a little bit of RAM with our last pattern 3 so we need to go and add that down the bottom here like so and up to our init RAM function we need to set it to something like so so we're setting it to 45 hex <coughs> which is a particular color pattern go and have a look at this um, 75, 71 well, it's currently set to 69 so that's the original pattern and the flipped version which is the first one we're going to write afterwards is 45 all right um, everything's in place let's build all good and run now once again depending on your eyes you should hopefully see the bottom section of the screen scrolling to the left or scrolling to the right depends on which way you look at it <coughs> and you could um, by maybe uh, adding some um, sprites that are also moving in a particular direction you would get the impression that the screen is moving a particular way and this is only using a very very simple pattern by using more complicated patterns perhaps using more tiles um, you can actually get some quite complex scrolling going on. Actually, there's um, there's actually a gentleman I've been following his progress recently who's actually right into this at the moment is making quite a smooth vertically scrolling um, shoot 'em up as we speak and learning the way. So there we go. We have a wonderful, colourful demo of what you can do with tiles on the TMS processor. Um, now there will be a, t a second part to this particular uh, side step that we're doing um, that will cover sprites. Um, and that's what so that's what we'll be doing in our next part is covering sprites all right so as usual um, you will find all the code for all th for the spectra video MSX and Coleco um, on my website as well as a link to the full text of the article we've used today um, and please of course ask any questions down below um, this particular book can still find it there are downloadable copies of it as well highly recommended if you want to know a little bit more technical detail than what is covered in this article but hopefully this has explained um, some of the possibilities of what you can do with the graphics processor on these machines 
um, and will help underpin some of the knowledge we've learnt so far. So one more episode will cover um, the sprites capabilities um, and then the episode of that we should start looking at some sound so we can start getting some zap sounds in our game. So we'll go back, we'll probably go back to the actual game for that particular episode. Alright, I'm Electric Adventures, thanks to all my subscribers, thanks for watching and I'll catch you next time. Thank <laughs> you.